Welcome to the Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva, and today we're going to get some insight into field hockey. My guest today is Carla Tagliente, and she's the head women's field hockey coach at Princeton University. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. So uh, usually I start my guests uh, where they went to college. So where'd you go to school? I went to the University of Maryland. Oh, okay. Graduated 2000. Okay, great. Yeah. So let's go back in time before we get into what you're doing. Um, so back in high school, when did it all start for you? When did you start thinking about going to college? Was it freshman year, senior year? When did it all begin? Well, I grew up with three brothers, so we're constantly playing different sports. And I didn't really have any interest in field hockey for a long time. It, it, I kind of stumbled into it as like a filler sport for the fall season. Um, and I, I, my dream and my goal was to go to college and play basketball. And right around freshman year, sophomore year, I kind of realized I wasn't probably going to grow past 5'3". <laughs> and that I could, you know, field hockey was still kind of a filler sport, but I, I liked it. I was getting better at it. I realized I could probably go further in it. I was receiving um, some correspondence from USA Field Hockey to start to play in some junior under 17 stuff and just got my head kind of spinning. Like I thought I could you know, take it and run with it, maybe play in, in an Olympics or the national team or go to, you know, go to a bigger college than what I could for basketball. So I, I continue to play both. That's back in the, the era where you could still play three sports and, you know, you weren't overcommitted in any. So it was awesome because I could go one to the other to the other, just blended into each other. Yeah. Um, in the spring, I, I would play, uh, I played softball a couple of years. I ran track a couple of years, played golf. So... But it, kind of, it was right around that sophomore year, I kind of, I started to focus more of my time in the summer, mm -hmm. doing more field hockey related stuff than just doing basketball camp after basketball camp after basketball camp. So it was right around that point, yeah. So you got recruited then for field hockey? I did, yep. And then uh, University of Maryland was your number one school or did you have a wide variety of schools? I had a wide variety. It was tough. I, you know, I was... Um, you know, shy, introverted kid. I didn't really love the recruiting process as, at that age. Um, it also happened much later than what it happens now. Uh, you, there, all the early recruiting, you wouldn't, it didn't exist then. So everything kind of ramped into your senior year, and then on whatever the date was, July one, I don't even remember. It was just, you know, your phone would just ring, 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 ring. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, it was overwhelming. And at that point, I'd been to a few summer camps. Um, I kind of have an idea, had an idea where, you know, three or four schools I was interested in. I didn't want have any interest in going far away. Um, I also didn't really have much interest in going to play. I think North Carolina was the number one team at the time. It didn't really intrigue me. I kind of wanted to be in a program I could make an impact in. Um, and I had the, the head coach at Maryland, who's still there, was the assistant national team coach. Wow. And I had... Uh, already kind of been introduced to her and played in the U.S. junior system. So we kind of had a pre-existing relationship and it made the recruiting process go a lot easier. Yeah. Um, and her involvement in that in the U.S. program obviously was to a young kid, very appealing. Um, and she also is a great coach and could probably sell you the, the sweater you're wearing. But, <laughs> uh, it, you know, I had a, a short list and it just, you know, every time I went to the school, it, it just felt like it was a good fit. Great. So now you go to University of Maryland. What happens at University of Maryland? Um, what's it like? What's it like? It's a bigger, you know, I grew up in a small town in, in upstate New York, central New York, really. I say upstate because everyone thinks uh, upstate is, or central is, you know, Hudson Valley, but around Syracuse area. Um, it was, you know, I wanted a bigger school. It's not huge. I mean, it's not like Ohio State size, but it's bigger. You know, mm -hmm. it's got a commuter aspect to it, but it, it's small enough if you want it to be small. It can be small. 
they were growing at the time in terms of their programs and, and their, what they were offering academically. Um, but the, the hockey team was competitive and it was, we, our first year, we had high expectations. I don't think we really kind of actualized them. You know, we did well. I think we were runners up in the ACC. Our second year, um, we had a, a young contingent of good, good players and we ended up uh, the underdog, and we won the ACC tournament that year out of nowhere. We ended up winning three consecutive years from there. Wow. Um, had a good run in the tournament. My soft, my junior year, we won the national championship, and then we returned everyone that se our senior year. We had zero graduating players. Obviously, the expectations were super high, and sure. um, I don't think we got cocky. It was more kind of you're kind of the target at that point, and. You know, I think we thought it would be challenging, but definitely doable to repeat. But we, we ended up losing in the Final Four that year. But wow. great teams, um, had a lot of great teammates from all over the country, all over the world. Um, but it was a great four years. Good. So now, how does one go from graduating University of Maryland to yeah. becoming the head coach at uh, for field hockey at Princeton University? It was a process. <laughs> um, right, so I, I don't think. Um, let us hear about it. I didn't start out, I think I left, uh, I was a major in finance and, and I was in the business school at, at Maryland and uh, I don't think, you know, just like a lot of kids today, I didn't know really what I wanted to do. I, when I finished, I, I was um, playing on the national team uh, from an early age. I made the team when I was 17. So I played all through college, uh, would leave a lot of the springs and, and kind of come back, leave for two weeks, come back. and balance uh, that type of travel schedule would finish with school as well and Maryland hockey. Um, so, you know, I continued coaching, or sorry, I continued um, playing after college for a couple couple more years and then uh, decided to be done and and really was kind of at this crossroads of what, you know, what am I going to do? And I had a few opportunities um, crop up in the, in the business world and then decided to take a job at the University of Iowa. Um, from there, I went to Michigan, University of Michigan, then Northwestern. And from there, I had my first head coaching job at, at UMass Amherst. Um, I was there for five years. Uh, so all up as an assistant, I think I was an assistant for about nine years before I got my first head coaching job. Wow. And then uh, five years at UMass. And then I think a lot of times, you know, I look at the process to get to being at UMass and a lot of it is the stars aligning, I, I think, and, and just good timing and being in the right place at the right time, obviously being qualified too. Um, but I would say the same for, for Princeton. I, I really didn't have any, you know, knowledge that, you know, Princeton was going to be open when it opened or, you know, have this dream that, you know, someday I'm going to coach because you just don't know. I mean, you see coaches stay for 20, 30 years in a job. If right. you wait for the one, you, you could, you know, <laughs> you could wait forever or it could never happen. Sure. But the timing, it lined up and, and the opportunity was there and Molly, Molly Mark who reached out and, um, it was, it really was a kind of a fast process. It happened in the summer uh, 2016, probably a month before we started. Wow. So it was a, a quick process, quick onboarding, getting to know the team. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the rundown so on it's it. It's a long list of going yeah, on. Yeah, I've been to a lot of schools. I think it's been uh, good in a lot of ways. I, I talked to a lot of, when I've had a lot of assistants over the years, and I think everyone's path to get to where they're at in coaching or business or if medicine where we're at is different it's not that my path was better i think what i can appreciate about my journey is just the the variety and the diversity of experience i had i had the opportunity to work for if you look at the profile of the schools you know from very large big 10 schools to very small private big 10 school to you know to to umass which is uh kind of a medium-sized school back down to a private ivy league school so Every, every stop I've made has been different. It's been eye-opening to kind of just try to understand the culture and, the, and you know, what, what it's like to be successful on that campus, what type of school each one, yeah. each, each school attracts, because all of them do attract a different type of student, a different type of student athlete. So now let's get into the student athletes. Um, so what do you look for for high school students that play field hockey um, what do you look for to come to Princeton University? Yeah, obviously we look for the, the best field hockey players we can, we can find. Um, and through recruiting in the summer, the, the big national events, we recruit off of the, the national junior teams, the under-17 team, the under-19 team. But obviously coming to Princeton, it doesn't matter if Susie is the best player in the country if she doesn't 
have something more to her. So that part is a bit trickier because it's not like you wear that on your on your sleeve. You, yeah. I, I don't know if you're walking around with an ACT score of a 35. I just, yeah, I don't know that. But that's where the recruiting process and getting to know them, getting to know their club coach and finding a little bit more about them is important. I think in my short time here, the, the one thing that has stuck out to me and Jim Barlow, kind of, he passed that information on to me. Um, he's the head soccer coach here at Princeton. When I first started was to, to not pull wool over someone's eyes. Like you might love a kid and and you might try to sell it to them and that, oh, you can, they might ask you, is it gonna be hard? And he's like, my instinct for many years was to just kind of be like, oh, you can do it, don't worry. Like they find a way or, you know, it's been done. And, and he said, my new tactic is just to tell them it's gonna be very hard. And that became apparent really quickly, I think, to just be honest. And it's not going to be very, like really hard. It's just, Princeton's Princeton. If you're not going to want a challenge and you're not gonna to wanna to come here to be challenged in field hockey, in every class you take and in have opportunities in front of you, then Princeton might not be the place for you. So I think Princeton in a lot of ways, it does sell itself. You know, we do go after kids that were like, oh, we, you know, they would be a program changer. But during the process, we might realize that it might probably is not a good fit. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably where we realize that it is that we're not sure that they're really open to the experience at Princeton. And like I said, it's not that it's it's all doom and gloom and hard, but you got to go into it with this appetite and, and of wanting to be challenged and, and wanting to have these opportunities because I don't, it, it, you know, why come to Princeton? You know, if you're not going to try to put your hand in a lot of different hats and, and grow as a person. Mm -hmm. And you could say that from, you know, every school really. It's really, your experience is gonna be what you put into it, you're gonna get out. Um, but Princeton offers an incredible array of opportunities for the students here. And I think for us, we're, we're constantly encouraging and challenging our players to, to take advantage of, of everything in front of them. Good. So um, how early do you start finding these, these students? Is it sophomore year, junior year, freshman year, eighth grade? Yeah, it's, it's dialed back from when I was being uh, going through the process. It, I think identification could start as eighth grade, seventh grade. I might see you play in, at that young. It, there's not really, for, for someone interested in Princeton, it's not gonna, for, for us, probably go very much further from there because you, if, you know, you come to me in eighth grade, you're really interested, you're, you're really talented, that's, that's awesome. But all, you, you don't have a four-year transcript to hand to me or even three years of school to hand to me. So it, we try to, you know, at that point, if someone's coming to campus and they come to a clinic or they come to a camp, just to get to know them and, mm -hmm. and just, you know, so they can put a face to a name and get excited about Princeton. And, and maybe it becomes a carrot at the end of, you know, the stick for them. They're, they're driven and they're motivated to you know, start out their freshman year and take challenging classes and succeed in school because Princeton's a place they, they can see themselves. Um, but it does start that young. And, I, you know, I, I wonder if you had someone else on the show that was just a parent of someone going through the process that wasn't playing a sport. You know, what age do kids start thinking about school now that aren't playing sport? I don't know. <laughs> that, that would be my question back. Yeah. Um, you know, do kids in eighth grade that are interested in, are they interested in Princeton that have no affiliation to any sport? I don't know. Um, but I do think it, you know, some kids are interested early on. Some kids, you know, go through the process and, and they start their process later on, sophomore, junior year, and they're, you know, they're thinking Princeton or the Ivy League might be a place for me. And that's fine. I think what I see happening is just the panic that sets in with kids. You know, they, they're, it's not, we don't recruit, we recruit more out of clubs than high school now. Obviously, these kids all go to high school, but when we see them, they're playing for their club teams. And what you see happening is this domino effect. They show up to practice and they hear that these five people have committed already to whatever school and they're in ninth grade or eighth grade or 10th grade. And it becomes like this, you know, everyone's looking over the shoulder of, you know, I, we're behind, we're falling behind. And this fear starts to ripple through. And, and Now, is that just a verbal commitment? Yeah. Because that's not an actual it's, commitment. It's just a verbal commitment. And yeah. in our sport, I think you hear about it more in other sports I have that, you know, kids might change their mind or schools might change their mind. Field hockey, it's been pretty on the up and up where a kid will make a commitment and stick by it and same to go for the school too. Mm -hmm. um, but with the Ivy, with an Ivy League school in Princeton, we've got to have more, 
more detail behind that, you know, in terms of, you know, are they academically going to be able to to get in and compete at Princeton? And, and there's no, the, the hard part about the recruiting process for Princeton really is there's no guarantee in that. And mm -hmm. you could come to me in your sophomore or your junior year and, and we might both agree that it's a, it's a great fit, but you can commit to the process, but that's about as far as it can go. You know, yeah. I can't. So it, it really means a lot for the grades. Yeah, the all grades the way are, through. They're seeing all the way through yeah. um, all four years, and so that's that's another thing. Um, you know, we, we've been recruiting against you know other top academic schools that are non-Ivy schools, and you know the kids get to their junior year and they just take the SATs once, and it's good enough. They put their feet up, and yeah. you know, it, whereas at Princeton you might have to take retests. SATs or ACTs a couple times to get your scores to the where they need to be at. So, so once they come to the school, what's what's the student looking at? What's the what's the pro process of the of uh, practices and things? Uh, when do they come to school? Is it August? Mm -hmm. do, do they start in July, uh, September? Give me a whole year of what that student's going to go through. Yeah, the, uh, the Ivy League for fall sports, they start a week later than the rest non-Ivy schools. So our, our entire season is just bumped a week. So we'll start mid-August. Um, and like it, since we're offset by a week, the rest of not, all the non-Ivy schools will probably have their first competition third weekend in August, where we'll have ours the last weekend in August. Um, so come to campus, is, uh, nothing really is different from a non-Ivy versus an Ivy with the athletic experience for the most part. Um, the preseason, same length, pretty much you, you're regulated a little bit by the Ivy League in, in number of hours and whatnot. But, you know, when I came here, I, that, I, I worried and stressed about that. And then I took my schedule from UMass and I laid it over top of what was allowed. And I was already doing under what the Ivy League limited you to so sure. I think it's a big misnomer of uh, you don't get as much training time or you're limited the kids can't develop and that's not the case at all and if you look at our roster we get a lot of interest from we have I think four or five under 21 US players on our team one under 18 German player on our team so you would think that they would choose a school where they can train all the time and you know just hypothetically have an opportunity to have more touches on the ball and grow and develop but we actually attract the lion's share of those kids into this program because of the name of the program. They're going to get a great experience. The program has proven and has a tradition of doing well. Um, and, and so we're, you know, by and large every year attracting a number of players off of those underage teams to come to Princeton. So now it's just a, a couple hours every day during the week and then, and then when yeah. are the games on the weekends? Yeah, games are on the weekend. We, we probably train depending on the number of games we play on that week. If we, only, if we have two games, like a Friday, Sunday or a Saturday, Sunday, we would be hypothetically off on Monday, train Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, roughly about an hour and 45 minute practice, uh, game Friday. Saturday would be like a regen day. Like we might group, re, we might regroup, um, do this some body regen, meaning like jog around, stretch, uh, look at some video, prep for the Sunday game, game Sunday off Monday. Gotcha. So if that was a, a two, what a two game weekend looked like, it would probably be rinse and repeat. So um, during the fall, how many games are in field hockey during the fall? Seventeen. Seventeen, and then the Christmas break comes. Yeah, right. we, we wrap up right before Thanksgiving. Christmas break comes. What the, are they doing in that Christmas break? Uh, just they, they'll they continue to like have a base workout plan template that they'll follow. It's not, you know, it's it's kind of at their, their leisure. They're, that's kind of our, our downtime and for them to, to regroup. But at Princeton, it's a long winter break. Um, they come back, they don't take finals until after the break. Uh -huh. So they come back early January, they have a readings period, they have finals, then they have an intercession break where they all go away. And then we've just started up uh, last week. So it's a very long break. During that break, I mean, we don't have any contact with them other than, you know, I mean, contact meaning like training time. Right. Um, so they're f primarily focused on family, coming back, school, mm -hmm. and then they regroup and then they come back. So now you said they started last week, which is February, yep. right? Um, so... Um, what happens in the, the spring Yep. from February until, I guess, July? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a non-glamorous time of the year. So, well, right now up until spring break, which is uh, mid-March, we'll condition three days a week, meaning lift and run. 
uh, the one day a week of individual session. Um, and then spring break hits, they're away a week, they come back. And then we, we get, um, it used to be 12 practices for the whole, from end of March through end of April. So you're looking at probably a month. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's dictated on hours, but it essentially comes out to the same. It's, it's about 12, 12 training, two hour training sessions. So we break that up. It, we could be training two, two or three times a week with hockey. We get three contests in that time frame. So it's very condensed in that month. Um, and then end of April hits and, and then they're focusing on finals. And so, then and school then is out. Dispersed. So, so what happens then from May until July? Do, do you put them on some kind of program that they're doing? Yeah, and they, they, yeah, they come back? they have lifting and running pro programs, but they, they... Or do they go do another team somewhere? Did, no, they, well, some like of that? them are playing U.S. hockey, so they might be transitioning and playing into playing in the summer. A lot of them are just working internships, you know, doing what Princeton students do. Um, and, and then they try to piece together their training around you know, the hours that they're, they're doing it. It gets challenging. Some of us are doing internships overseas. We had one in South Africa this summer, Vietnam, um, Namibia. So, I, you know, we had to have somewhat flexible plans for some of them because they don't have access to the same, to the same training facilities yeah. that you'd have if you just stayed, you know, in the area for the summer. So everyone's doing something different. And, you know, for, for us, our philosophy is, is, it's their time, I and mean, this is their time to take advantage of the opportunities of being at Princeton and what Princeton offers. And right. there's a lot of different things offered through the summer through through the university that they can they can do. And some go overseas, some stay in the country with internships, like I said, and 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 some, you know, have a balance of what they're doing. So uh, where are you looking? Because I'm, I'm assuming the summer months is when you're really doing majority of recruiting. Yeah. Where are you looking? Because you said it's not just the high schools, it's it's outside the high schools. Yeah. So what are some of the places that these students should be playing in that you're you're looking at these these particular yeah. events? Uh, it's, a, it's a variety. Some come to our clinics or our camps. So they and that would be my number one recommendation for a kid. Just narrow your list down. Go to those schools, go to some, go to a clinic, go to a camp because you're going to get right in front of the coaches and be right on campus and see the, the campus and get a feel of the size of it in the town. And a lot of times they'll have players working it or their staff. And there's not really a better way to get to get intimate with, you know, do I like this or do I not like this than that? I think with how quick the recruiting process has become, it's become very transactional and not as much relationship based as it used to. And I think this is the one way to, to bring back in b those relationship building opportunities. So we encourage that. Um, even for kids we've identified that we know we like, we still try to get them just to campus so that we can try to get a better understanding of, of them, their family, what, you know, what motivates them. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the other opportunities I would say are there's just various tournaments through the summer through clubs. So a lot of these kids are playing in already with clubs, affiliated with different clubs around the country. Mm -hmm. The majority of them are in the Northeast region, um, but there's regional club championships, there's national club championships. Um, there's also a U.S. pipeline, similar to the U U.S. soccer pipeline, where it's not club-based, but it's individual-based. And mm -hmm. these kids play in these regional training centers and get identified, and then they'll move along and move along and play in different tournaments. So we obviously will frequent those. So if a kid is playing in that it's just good information to have hey hey coach we're i'm going to be playing this weekend in lancaster in this tournament you know by chance we're probably already going there but just giving us a heads up that they're going to be there because there's if you've written us we're always going to try to see you to make sure we're not you know leaving any stone unturned now do you see a lot of international kids uh mm -hmm. as well and yeah. how do you see them a lot of those are coming to like contacting us first. It's not so much us going out and going to Holland, going to England, going to South Africa, and just, we didn't, we didn't have the funds to do it. But a lot of that is, is generated um, from them reaching out to us or in those, there's certain companies that have organized themselves that kids go yeah. into that reach out to us. And so we might get one of these companies reaching out to us that they have us highly academic kid that's looking at a few different Ivy schools, they'll send us a video link and some a resume and that's how it starts from there. You know, if we like them or we think it it's might be a good you. fit, we kind of take it from there and get in touch and 
start the relationship. Um, we may try to go overseas and, and see see that person, or if there's a group or a tournament where we think we could get more value for our money, you know, where we could see multiple prospects, we would do that. So that that happens all year, you know, p- people yeah. reaching out and they're they're interested, they're interested, and in just trying to to manage that international pipeline is is kind of a year round thing. Great. Well, we're coming to the end of our show. All right. Uh, usually I ask my guests, uh, what advice do you want to give to the parents and the students that uh, want to come to Princeton University for field hockey? I think I would go back to what I said about the recruiting process and, and just take your time and, and don't, you, you don't need to be knee-jerky and overreact. And I think there's still a place and a time to make this a relationship-based journey in, in, in picking your college. And it really should be. It's where you're going to be for the next four years, it's it's really for these student athletes. It's it's the biggest decision they've that they've made yet in their lives, and their first big decision that they're going to make for most of them. Um, and I think you know what advice would I have for them to to get to be able to come to Princeton or to be able to get to Princeton? It it would it, it's it's tough. I mean, we're a top ten program, top five program. Some years, it's the number one university in the country. I would you know you've got to be able to balance both, and I think. They've got to be able to you know, obviously compete at a high level, but be able to handle the academic rigors. And I, for me, it would be to challenge yourselves in the classroom, to not cut corners, take challenging classes, but take cha- classes that are interesting to you too. Those are the ones that you tend to do better in and the ones that will probably lead you into finding something that you're going to like to do in the next phase of your life. Um, and I think Princeton offers a, a lot of opportunity, but I think just like I said, engaging in that process of that recruiting process and figure out if Princeton is a good fit for me. On the hockey side, you know, it would be the same as academically. You got to find opportunities that are going to challenge you and put yourself in challenging situations where you might fail. Um, but a lot of this on the academic side and the athletic side, I think probably the overarching message would be set your expectations high, but be okay with failing and just understand like it's, it, it's okay. People that are here at Princeton have failed in things. And I've failed in a million things. It's really what you do after that and how you recover from that and with the growth you've had from that. And I think it's all about, you know, even in college, you know, we're still encouraging when we always encourage them to set their expectations high. And it, it's about the growth. It's not about the failing and the succeeding. It's about the growth. And I think if you can be process oriented, Princeton can be a place for you. If you're going to be very fixated on end results and, and at the end game, it, it, it may not happen for you. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming yeah. on the show. I appreciate Thanks for it. Thanks having me. Yeah. So you've been watching The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva. Until next time. Mm-hmm.